Let's open our Bibles together, if you would please, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to finish out our study in the epistle of 1 Timothy tonight by looking at the last chapter, chapter 6. If you don't happen to have a Bible, the ushers are making their way down the aisles right now with some Bibles in hand, so just raise your hand in their direction and they will be glad to give you a Bible. If you take a Bible from one of our ushers, it's page 841 in those church Bibles. 1 Timothy in your New Testaments, chapter 6, the last chapter of this epistle. Next week, Lord willing, we'll be into 2 Timothy as we just make our way straight through the Bible here on Sundays and Wednesdays. Sundays we're in Isaiah presently, and tonight finishing out 1 Timothy. Next Wednesday night we'll be into 2 Timothy. So if you have your Bibles handy there, let's first pray, and then we will look into this last chapter together. Lord, thank you for this time now as we worship you through the studying and the application of your word. And we thank you, Lord, for your love for us and your grace and your patience and your mercy. Speak to us now through the pages of Scripture. We love you, Lord, and we thank you that you first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. Uh, if you haven't been here for our study of 1 Timothy, I'm going to summarize the last several weeks and bring us up to speed. Uh, Paul is writing what we call a pastoral epistle to Timothy, who is, relatively speaking, a young pastor of the church at Ephesus. He is believed to be about 30 years of age, but he refers to him as a young man, so it's all relative. But here, uh, Paul writes this letter as an encouragement, an exhortation, uh, and um, some direction to Timothy as he pastors this church, and we've come to, to realize that in the course of this letter, Paul is spelling out what will end up being on our list, seven things that should define the church. So we've already been through six of these things. He talks in chapter one about the need for the church to be a place of sound doctrine. In chapter one, verse three, he says, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrine any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. So the church should be a place of sound doctrine. Number two, it should also be a place of grace. Paul goes on in chapter one to talk a little bit about his own testimony. In verse uh, 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. He said, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, because those are three terms that he uses to describe his own past. What would be some words, I'm not asking you to call out loud, but what would be some words that you would describe concerning yourself and your past? And yet, he says, and this is good news for all of us, despite my past, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. And he says, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So the church should be a place of grace where people understand you can have a past and you can be forgiven and God can make a new life out of your, you know, somebody once said, out of my mess comes my message, which is now my testimony of God's grace and his wonderful forgiveness in, in my life. And then also he says, number three, it should be a place of prayer. He starts out chapter two by saying, I urge then first of all that requests and prayers and intercession be made with thanksgiving for everyone. And then he gets specific, especially for kings and all those in authority that we might live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Number four, he also tells us that the church should be defined as a place with godly elders and deacons. And into chapter three, he says that there's a trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer or an elder or a pastor, he desires a noble task. And then he goes on through chapter three to talk about the qualifications for elders and deacons. Uh, number five on our list is that the church should also be a place that, that is clearly teaching the Bible. In chapter four, verse 13, Paul exhorts Timothy. He says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture to preaching and to teaching. So that's why we devote a large portion of all of our services and all our gatherings to teaching God's Word to the public reading of Scripture because it is really through God's Word that we are equipped, that we come to salvation. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So it is important not to dilute God's Word, uh, not to deny God's Word, but to apply it, to read it, to teach it, 
And so that's why we do what we do around here. And then uh, last week we talked about number six on the list is the caring of, for people. In chapter five, Paul draws particular attention to widows, and he distinguishes uh, older widows from younger widows and how the church should come alongside, but, but not in every case, because sometimes a widow has family members that should step up to the plate and have first priority in taking care of family members. So he, he discusses that at length in chapter five, and now we come here to chapter six. And the main point out of chapter six is Number seven on our list, it's the last point on our list, and it is that the church should be defined as a place where people are pursuing godliness. Now, Paul loves that word godliness, as we've mentioned before through this letter, because the word godliness does not appear anywhere in the New Testament until you get here to 1 Timothy. And then when you get here to 1 Timothy, that word godliness, or or NIV, sometimes we use the word godly, Uh, but it is a word that appears in the original Greek language eight times in the book of 1 Timothy. So nowhere in the New Testament until 1 Timothy, and then Paul drops it eight times. So it's really emphasized a lot here in this sixth chapter. Let me just do a quick survey with you and show you here in chapter six, look at verse three. He says, if anyone teaches false doctrine and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to godly teaching, and that's, that's the same word. Some translations say, and to the teaching of godliness. So that's a use of the word. And then he goes further down, verse, verse four, I'll just keep reading. He is conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions. Verse five, and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness, there's the word again, is a means to financial gain. Next verse, verse six, but godliness, there's the word again, godliness with contentment is great gain. And then also he uses the word in verse 11 when he says, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Now we'll come back and we'll talk about all these verses, but I just wanted to point out to you that You know, four out of the eight times that Paul emphasizes godliness in this letter is here in chapter six. So he really ends strongly on this theme of uh, the church being a place where people pursue godliness. Now, we've talked about this, but again, just to kind of define it, godliness is from an old English word, godlikeness. And the breakdown of the word in, in the Greek, the original language of the New Testament is the word eusebia from two Greek words, eu, you, is the prefix of this word, meaning well, and sebomei is the suffix of the word, and it means devout worship or reverence. So godlikeness or godliness is when we are uh, living a life that is devoted well to God, that worships well God, that it reveres well God, and that we should be intent about this. We should be intentional about wanting to live lives of purity and holiness, okay? Um, Look, you know, when when you and I get saved, the Bible speaks about our sanctification in in a few different um, progressive terms. We are sanctified when we trust Christ as our Savior because the word sanctified means to be set apart, to be made, made holy under the Lord. That happens The moment you trust Christ as your Savior, you are marked by the Lord, set apart for the Lord, and you're sanctified in Him. But the Bible also speaks of sanctification as a progress and process of your Christian walk, where it's not just a one and done. It is a lifestyle committed to living for the glory of God, that we want to honor Him in the way we speak, okay? Get rid of all filthy language. We want to honor Him in the way we live, okay? Love your wives, respect your husbands, uh, be devoted to one another in love. Um, Don't be sleeping around your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Honor the Lord in in everything about the way you conduct business and and everything about our lives should reflect the godliness, the godlikeness. And then, and, and, and then, you know, progressively until the day that we are ultimately with the Lord, and then our sanctification is sealed once and for all because there is no flesh that is warring with our soul. But as Christians, we need to be devoted to the Lord in God-likeness and holiness and walking in this 
reverence and worship and devotion to the Lord, doing it well, because it honors Him. Uh, and, and so, this is the life of the Christian, uh, and this should be our constant pursuit. So, let's start here at chapter 6 and make our way through this chapter this evening and, and see here as, as Paul uh, ends this letter with some final exhortations here. So, he says in verse 1, he says, all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider that their master's worthy of full respect, circle that word respect, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Those who have believing masters are not to show less respect for them because they are brothers. Instead, they are to serve, circle that word, serve them even better because those who benefit from their service are believers and dear to them. These are the things you are to teach and urge on them. So, Timothy uh, is instructed here by Paul that when he's addressing those within his congregation who might be slaves, and, and I'll define that in a moment, this is first century Rome, that the, the exhortation here is, I, I want you to serve your masters with respect, and I want you to serve them well, I want you to honor them, whether your masters are believers or not. Now, again, we need to get context on this passage because I don't want anybody to think, and sometimes skeptics and critics of the Bible accuse the Bible of somehow condoning slavery because it speaks of slavery here. I mean, why doesn't Paul just come right out and say, this is wrong, this is evil, this is inhumane, which it is all those things. The reason why he's not saying those things in this passage, though when you look at the sum total of Scripture, God clearly is opposed to slavery, man's inhumanity to man. The reason why Paul's not dealing with it on a moral level is because first century Roman Empire, gang, listen, 30 to 40 percent of the entire Roman Empire were slaves. They were not slaves in the way that our own history has marred America. They were not slaves by virtue of someone's race. A person was a slave in first century Roman Empire because they were either prisoners of war, it's, it's still not justified, I'm just explaining, prisoners of war, or in the Roman Empire, you could actually sell yourself into slavery because you owed a debt that you couldn't repay. When someone became uh, in over their heads financially, they could sell themselves, and so we would say more or less an indentured servant but you would now be property to somebody within the Roman Empire that you as a Roman citizen sold yourself into slavery. Now, you could purchase your freedom back, and once you got back on your feet, you could regain your freedom, purchase your freedom, or your master might give you your freedom as a gift, but the typical slave in the Roman Empire was either a prisoner of war uh, or someone who sold themselves as a Roman citizen into slavery. What Paul is doing here, he's saying, okay, listen, if you find yourself in this circumstance, either by virtue of you were taken against your will as a prisoner of war, or you sold yourself into slavery, make the best of that circumstance. So, he's not condoning slavery here, okay? The Bible is clear about the mistreatment of one person to another, and, uh, and, and yet what he's saying is, if you find yourself in that situation, this is my advice to you. I want you to respect your masters. Now, this is, you, we can translate this to 21st century friends, okay? In, in your place of employment or whatever structure you find yourself in within some structure of authority, respect authority. That's one message that is clear to take away from this instruction here, okay? Again, we're, we're living in a day when people don't respect authority as much as they used to, and it's tragic and it's sad. But, it, you know, it used to be much more, you know, yes, I, I remember growing up, and my dad usually watches from Virginia Beach, so where is, hey, Dad. But I can remember growing up that it was, you know, until I got older, it was yes, sir, and no, sir in my house. And it wasn't, it wasn't like with, you know, a heavy hand. It was just my dad was teaching me respect from an early age. And then, you know, I, I think around being a teenager, you know, then then there was an understanding of respect, but I remember just as a little, so I didn't have to keep saying that, but as a, as a little kid, I just remember that was, it was yes, sir, it was no, sir, it was yes, ma'am, it was no, ma'am, and it wasn't even just with mom and dad, it was with older adults that I would meet. Now, how many of you remember saying yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, okay, and, so, and but what that did was it, it, it instilled within me 
just a measure of respect. And we're living in a culture now where that is just not as prevalent. And uh, I think we have to do a better job of instilling those things in our children, the next generation, because when they grow up, they're going to have to have a boss that they report to, or they're going to have to have some manager, or they're going to have to have, you know, some, somebody in their life who is an authority figure. And we have to learn to be respectful. So Paul says here, you know, if you find yourself in the circumstance, I want you to be respectful. He even adds here, as a believer, and one of the beautiful things about Christianity is it levels the playing field, okay? There's no better than or worse than people. It's men aren't better than women, women aren't better than men, white's not better than black, black's not better than white. Uh, and, and in this context of first century, slave's not better than free, and free's not better than slave. Because Christianity is, is, is the universal equalizer. Where, where we are all valued and we are all equal in the eyes of God because of the cross. Jesus Christ died for all, and God is no respecter of persons because God loves all and died for all, okay? So we all have equal value. And one of the things that Paul was doing intentionally was when I validate the value of slaves that in the culture were regarded as second-class citizens, I'm actually making people aware that the playing field is, is level and so one of the things that he says here is, now listen, if you happen to be a slave and you're serving a master, if your master happens to be a believer, don't slack off in your responsibilities. Because he said it would be easy to just start to relate to one another as, you know, and, and don't do this with your boss either, by the way, right? So like if you work at a place where your, your boss is a Christian, don't be just like, yo, bro, I guess I can just slide in here like a half hour late tomorrow morning because we're all Christians, word, you know? Don't do that because it'll be like, word, you're on your way out. And so Paul's saying here like, okay, listen, if you happen to have the pleasure of, of serving a, a master who is a believer, he says, he says don't, um, he says in verse 2, those who have believing masters are not to show less respect for them because they're brothers. Like, I, guess I, I guess you'll show me favors now because we're, we're bros, all right? Or sisses. Uh, but, you know, and, uh, and he says, but instead, he says, they are to serve them even better, even better. So the other word I ask you to, serve there, uh, to circle is the word serve, because I think respect and serve, respect and serve are terms that should never die in the heart of a Christian. We should always be showing respect to other people, and we should always have the disposition of serving them. You know, Jesus washed his disciples' feet for a reason, because he wanted to teach a lesson to all of us, beginning with his own disciples, to serve and to just be willing to humble yourself and not to be better than, but to just be willing to serve and to help and to just, to just consider others better than yourselves and to show that in the way that you treat them and serve them and love them. Well, then he goes on here in verse 3 to address the potential uh, problem that material ambition can pose in the life of the believer. So he warns here, verse 3, if anyone teaches false doctrines uh, and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in every strife and, uh, sorry, envy, strife, malicious talk, uh, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Now, in this passage here, what, what Paul is referring to are, are those within the congregation. He's not addressing this with Timothy. He's saying, listen, I want you to be aware that within the numbers, there's going to be some people who have this, unhe- let's, let's just say this, this unhealthy obsession with wanting to argue over words. And not just want to argue over words, but want to argue over words that are about false doctrine. So, it's, it's a double whammy here. David Guzik, in his commentary, he said this section here is basically a warning against the uh, argumentation uh, of heretics, where, where people get together and they want to talk about doctrine that is, that is incorrect doctrine, and then they just want to argue about it. And, and that's just not healthy in any church. 
okay? It's not healthy to just start to debate and split hairs over words. So, I mean, look, words are important. Words are important, and, and, and the corruption of a word or two can mean the difference between solid doctrine and false doctrine. So I'm not downplaying the importance of words, but some people can just like be obsessed with a word, and then they want to argue with Christians over what does elect mean? And let's talk about elect, and who is elect, and were you elect before you were elect, or have you always been elect? I mean, do you know people like this? It's not healthy. It's okay to just have discussions, but some people obsess about it, and this is the warning here. And what makes it worse is, again, when they quarrel about words that are really false doctrine. So it's just a double whammy here, argumentation of heretics. Uh, and then he, but then that last part there in verse 5 seems a little out of place. He says, he says, who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gains. Uh, what in the world does that mean? You know, I think today when we think about um, some false doctrines that float around and they can be ever so subtle, um, I think one of those is how Christianity is commonly presented in terms of what you gain by following Jesus. And unfortunately, people think that coming to faith in Jesus is a stepping stone to material success or happiness. And you may experience material success and happiness uh, after coming to know Christ or before coming to know Christ, um, but we, what we need to realize is that the gospel of Jesus Christ, I mean, what we gain is what we don't deserve anyway. And what we gain is forgiveness and redemption and acceptance, and, 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 and for that we have an eternal inheritance in, in heaven, okay? But if we think this life in following Christ is all about just how my life can be improved and what I gain out of it, we are sadly mistaken because the Christian life is about dying to self, and it's about taking up your cross daily and dying to self, and it's about living a sacrificial life for the glory of God. And it is, it is about um, seeing ourselves as, as dead and alive in Christ, and no longer living for the pleasures of this world or for what I can get out of it, but it's what, what I can give to the kingdom, how I can serve the kingdom, how I can honor the Lord in my life of sacrifice and, and self-denial and just dying to self. So I think we have, you know, kind of almost a Western concept of Christianity these days where we think, you know, come to Christ and Jesus makes you rich and Jesus, you know, um, you never have another sickness in your life. And if you do, it's because you don't have enough faith and all this kind of nonsense gang. And listen, what God calls us to is a sacrificial life of following Jesus, because we can never outgive what God has given to us. And, and what we gain uh, in Christ in terms of His forgiveness is, is far exceeds uh, anything that we could ever hope or imagine and what God has done on, on our behalf that we didn't deserve. And so he, that, there's just this warning here. You know, don't think that God is this means to just a more comfortable life and a more you know, financially uh, beneficial life. God may bless you financially, but he's going to go into this next section and talk more specifically about money. So let's, let's talk about it. Verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. That's a great verse. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Circle the word contentment. That really is the issue in our lives is contentment. We're often discontent because we never think that what we have is enough. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul would write in verses 10 through 12, he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, for you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So one key to godliness, he says here, is contentment. Just be content 
Be content. Now, that doesn't mean you should never achieve. That doesn't mean you should never, you, you, you know, um, uh, desire to be promoted or desire to have a, a raise in your salary. But if, if those things are our ambition, if those things are the driving thing behind us instead of the drive to be more like Jesus, then we're not content. We're going to be constantly just, you know, feeling like we're lacking and we never have enough. So he cautions here, godliness with contentment is great gain. And he adds, for, verse, verse 7, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. You know, I... All three of my kids, I was there when they were born. Not one of them came with a wallet. <laughs> they quickly wanted one when they were old enough to know that I had one, but nobody, they, they didn't come in with a wallet or a cell phone. It was amazing. Uh, they were born with nothing. Uh, Job said in Job 121, naked I came into my mother's womb, uh, from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. You know, I came naked, I'm going to depart naked. I didn't have anything when I came. I ain't going to take anything with me. And there's a lot of people who try to take things with them. Case in point, take a look at this picture, Mrs. Sandra West. Now, it's black and white because she died in 1977, but she was a millionaire heiress to a, an oil, a Texan oil tycoon, and her wish was to be buried in this car that she's sitting on. It happens to be a 1964 powder blue 250 GT Ferrari. Dirt cheap now, is it? Well, literally, because she was buried in it in the dirt. That's how dirt cheap it is. Here's actually a, a, a color version of it. It's a pretty car. Pretty car, but she, her wish was, her dying wish, she died March the 10th, 1977, in her Beverly Hills home. She wanted to be flown back with her Ferrari to Texas, where she could be buried next to her husband, Ike West. And so she was, and so here's a picture, an old newspaper clipping of, um, of the plot that was dug. Now, if you can see, so this is the big plot, and here they're lowering, this was the delivery of her Ferrari in this wooden container here, and then they're gonna lower it down into this big hole in the ground, and she's inside it, and her instructions were, I wanna be in my white lace nightgown in the front seat behind the wheel, at a slightly reclined position. <laughs> and so they followed her wishes, and so they dropped her. So she's in the box, so they dropped her in the dirt, so it is dirt cheap now. And, uh, and she's buried there. But you know, somebody needs to tell her, you, you can't take it with you. But uh, some people try. He adds in verse eight, but if we have food and clothing, notice he's talking about the basic essential elements. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Now, verse 9 and 10, he says, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So I'm going to put these two verses up on the screen because I want us to just spend a little bit of time understanding this um, because um, we need to get proper context and, and understand the intent and the meaning behind it. Um, question, is money bad? No. no. Money is not bad, and that's not what he's saying here. And I know some people who misquote this verse from time to time, who talk about how money is the root of all evil. That's a misquoting of the verse. It doesn't say that money is the root of all kinds of evil. It says in verse 10, what's, what, is the, what is the real problem? Love. The love of money. It's the love of money. In the Greek, it is uh, philoguria, from two Greek words, philos meaning love, and argos meaning silver. So it literally means just the love of silver, the obsession with it, the covetousness of it, the, the greed of it, the love of that is a root, not the only root, but a root of all kinds of evil. And he talks about how, you know, people, you know, eager for, for money with that obsession plunge themselves into ruin and destruction, and some people eager, wander from the faith, pierce themselves with many griefs. I mean, we, we don't have to look very far to understand a lot of different stories that have emerged 
as the result of the harm that money can do in the hands of people who don't understand the right management of it. Um, not just the squandering of it. I'm talking about, you know, how many foolish, wicked things have been done over money. How many people have fought over money? How many families have been split because somebody's will was read, and now there's a fight in the family over money? Um, how, how, many, um, how many people have gotten divorced over money? I mean, money can do crazy things to people. How many people have been murdered over money? And again, it's probably because I watch too many forensic files, but I mean, you know, it's the classic, you know, take an insurance policy on the husband or the wife, and then all of a sudden they end up dead. You know, a life insurance policy that's worth, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, and all of a sudden they were. People do crazy, wicked, evil things over money. I mean, how many people have uh, 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 sold secrets of the United States? I mean, people have, have betrayed their own country and betrayed people over money. So this kind of thing, we, we don't have to, you know, debate this. Everybody understands that money in the hands of wrong people with wrong motives who love it too much uh, is likely to cause people to do some very crazy and evil things. And he says here that in verse 10, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. The word wander is a Greek word that can mean seduced. So you can be seduced by money. You can be seduced by the love of it, by the power of it, by the pursuit of it. And Jesus even warns in Matthew 6, 24, that we cannot serve God and money because they will end up both competing with, with each other. So there's only one master in our lives, and it's either going to be God or not. And a lot of people will end up, if it's not God, making material things their God. And Jesus says you can't serve both God and money as masters. You're either going to hate one and be devoted to the other or the other way around. And so there are too many people who are devoted to money like it's a God, and, and they have sold their souls for money. So, so there's this caution here. But also realize that the whole counsel of Scriptures basically teaches us that money makes a terrible master, but it makes a wonderful servant. And money in the hands of godly people who understand the right stewardship of it, that all of it comes from the hand of God and all of it belongs to God and we're just entrusted with it to manage it and to use it, money can then be used for great purposes for the glory of God. Okay, now I don't say this disparaging poor people, but no poor people builds churches. No poor people build hospitals, build orphanages, okay? Wealthy people build churches and hospitals and orphanages and homes for unwed mothers. So it's not like money's evil. It's not like don't ever make money, okay? The Bible is not like putting down success and achievement and accomplishment. It's warning, though, the potential of greed and covetousness in our own hearts. And, and the remedy to, to being free from greed and covetousness is generosity. That's always the remedy. If you have a fear of being, I don't want to be greedy, I don't want to be covetous, then be generous. And Paul, if you actually glance down further to verse 18, where Paul says in verse 18, command them to do, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. So he even reminds us that the key to not being consumed and obsessed with money or material things is to always practice generosity. What God wants from us is an open hand, not a tight fist. That's what God always wants. So his warning here against those who are tight-fisted, his warning here against those who it's all about money, that's their ambition, God's not priority. Just make sure that God is the Lord of your life, not material things, and then use what God has given you for the furtherance of the kingdom and to honor God and to glorify Him. Because when God blesses you, He blesses you for a reason. And the reason is not that you might just retain it all and hoard it all, but the reason is that you might be a conduit. The reason is that you might be a funnel of what God has given. You know what did God say to Abraham when God blessed Abraham so much? I will bless you that you might be a blessing. And when God blesses you, He blesses you in order to be a blessing. Now, along these lines, let me put some things in perspective. And I think this is important for us as Americans to always get the right perspective. So Forbes magazine, a couple of years ago on Forbes.com, you can look this up, just to help us get a perspective. The typical person in the United States of America 
in the bottom 5% of the distribution of income, okay, so the 5%, the lowest 5% of Americans in terms of economic class are better off than 68% of the rest of the world. The lowest five, the poorest person in the United States is wealthier than 68% of the rest of the world's population. To give you even a more, uh, to, to give you an even greater perspective, if you are stuck in the lowest 5% of U.S. income, your standard of living is equal to that of the top 5% of the entire country of India. Let me say that again. If you're in the lowest 5% bracket in the United States, the equivalency is you're in the upper 5% of the entire country of India. Over 4 billion people, 95% of them are living inferior to your lifestyle. So it's an amazing thing when we stop and consider just perspective for a little bit. Uh, Huffington uh, Post, um, there was a, an article that somebody wrote, let me see if I have it here somewhere, um, which I thought also kind of helps us to get perspective. Um, I'm just going to read a little excerpt of it. With money, there is no such thing as enough. Unlike food, entertainment, sleep, or social outings, few people ever say, that is sufficient, no more needed. There is no X amount of dollars in the bank that feels satisfying. In fact, a multimillionaire I know in San Francisco said to me once when I asked him why he works at a job he doesn't like, he answered, you can never have enough money. He says, if we live a life of comparison, we set ourselves up for misery. Someone else will always have a bigger house, a grander wedding, fancier vacation. This never ever, ever ends, no matter how hard you work, what you buy, or where you live. This is, a, this is like a trap, this article says. We, we start out small, get a little promotion, and we're thrilled. My first job paid me 28,000, this article says. I got a promotion of 35,000. I, I thought I was the highest roller for a couple of weeks, and over the course of my career, I earned 50,000, then I earned 100,000, and so forth, none of which seemed enough after a couple of months in my new salary bracket. Very quickly, as human beings become used to each new standard of living and want more, psychologists call this hedonic, hedonic, from hedonist, hedonic adaptation. He said, we get used to our upgrades very quickly, and if you own a boat and a cool car, you'll be looking achingly at a yacht and the newer version of your already sweet ride pretty, sw pretty soon. And then he adds this, and I thought this was a pretty interesting comment, true wealth is an internal condition, and the sooner we make up our minds that we have enough, no matter our circumstances, the happier we are. I think in a secular sense, he was trying to say what Paul was saying in a biblical sense, you know, contentment is the real key. So again, John Wesley once said, uh, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. So the Bible's not a downer on achievement, accomplishment, and making money, but the Bible is a strong warner about how the power of money can sometimes control us and we become obsessive and we serve money as a God instead of the Lord. So be good steward of what God has given you and bless the kingdom and bless others, and be a funnel for God's goodness to, um, to be a blessing. Now, he's going to come back to money a little bit on the end, but let's carry on to verse 11. He says, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Now, I want you to notice there in verse 11, he says, flee from all this. I ended up counting seven final exhortations of Paul in this last section to Timothy, which I think are good for all of us. He's going to say to him, flee, these, these are the, the commands, the imperatives, flee, fight, take hold of, keep, command, talking about as a pastor, command others, guard, and turn away from. So let's make our way through this passage and, and see how he uses these words. So again, flee from all this, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Verse 12, fight the good fight of the faith. 
Okay, Paul's going to reiterate that in his next letter, 2 Timothy 4, 7. Paul's going to say about himself, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. So he warns us, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Okay, talking about, you know, uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10 is with your heart you believe and, and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And so, you know, to confess Jesus as Lord, he says, hold on to that. Verse 13, in the sight of God who gives life to everyone, everything rather, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. Okay, now what was that good confession? Well, basically when Jesus was standing in front of Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate uh, prodded him with a few questions, for example, in Matthew 27, 11, Pilate said, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, it is as you say. So he's, he's giving a faithful testimony. I am a king of the Jews, but I'm not of this world. I'm of a greater kingdom. Jesus would also say to Pilate in John 19, verse 11, you would have no power over me except that it was given to you by my Father, which is in heaven. So he testifies to the sovereignty of God. So there are different things in that conversation of Jesus in front of Pontius Pilate where Jesus is just being in the face of death, faithful to the end. And that's what Paul's saying here to, to all of us and to Timothy. He's like, you know, just be faithful to the good confession. You know, be true to your testimony. Don't deny the faith. Don't be embarrassed about knowing Jesus. You know, those of you young, you're going back to school in a couple of weeks. Be faithful in your testimony of Jesus. Don't, don't, don't care so much about what other people think of you. You know, live your life to honor Jesus. Don't worry about who doesn't like that you love Jesus. Live your life in such a way that you hold on to that good confession. He says, I charge you, verse 14, to keep this command without spot or blame unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, as Jesus coming again, which God will bring about in his own time, God the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever, amen. Okay, John would also say in 1 John 1, 5, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Verse 17, Paul says to Timothy, and I want you to command these things. Verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Isn't that good? Amen. Everything, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of the heavenly lights. It does not change like shifting shadows, James tells us. And he adds in verse 18, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds. You know, God makes us wealthy in many ways besides materially, right? So be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation. Notice this. They will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. You know, Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, he said something similar. He says, do not, in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is there will your heart be also. I really do believe that Jesus meant, and I think Paul reinforces it here, that you can actually use the money that God blesses you with to make an eternal investment. That we can, by virtue of how we are good stewards of what God has given us in this lifetime, use our finances in a way that have eternal dividends. You know, to, to, to use money for the advancement of the gospel and, and, and that in its various forms. So build an orphanage that shares the gospel, that brings Christ as centric to those orphans. You know, home for un unwed mothers and again, building churches and hospitals. Wherever the gospel can be advanced, and you have that ability to, to financially advance it in a way, you're making an eternal investment that pays eternal dividends because it translates in a way of 
being used for the glory of God in the, in the advancement of the gospel for the transformation of souls. So, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting concept here. We talks about, you know, don't lay it up here on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And then he adds there at the end, verse, verse 20, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. You can insert your own name there. Guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in so doing have wandered from the faith. And then as Paul ends most of his letters, grace be with you. Amen. Well, we'll pick it up there next week into 2 Timothy, so read ahead. 2 Timothy are Paul's dying words. It's the last letter that he writes before he's beheaded. So think about what would be your final parting words, the most important things you'd ever want to say to people. That's what we're going to read starting next week. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your love toward us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this sixth chapter. Lord, may we take these things to heart. It wasn't just written to Timothy for Timothy's benefit. It was written, Lord, that inspired by your spirit for the benefit of all. So may we apply these things in our own hearts and lives, and we just give you praise and thanks together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.